Okay, so here we are, chapter nine, linkage and genetic maps. Uh, this is gonna be a brick of a chapter, okay? It is dense, this is tricky stuff, the calculations are hard, it's a massive puzzle, so you're gonna definitely need some time to uh, watch YouTube videos and practice these things. If you just watch people doing it but don't actually try doing it, it's going to not go well, okay? Uh, there is one chunk we're not doing, we are skipping toolbox 1.9 because we're not going to go into that deep of a um, detail on, which is this one? Oh, uh, let's see, the crossover suppression by balancer chromosomes. We're not doing that. So uh, everything else in the chapter, yes. Every chromosome has hundreds, if not thousands of genes located on it. Okay. And if you have genes, so here's A and B, that are on the same chromosome, they're not going to inherit independently. Okay, you're not going to get that lovely spread of independent assortment. Okay, their inheritance is going to be linked to each other. Uh, now, what we did chapter eight last week is that if the genes are on different chromosomes, then they're all going to they're going to segregate nicely. They're going to randomly assort, and you're going to have this you know your nine to three to three to one, or we're going to do do our forked line diagram, and it'll sort out. Lovely. <clears throat> this is when that doesn't happen. So linkage. Okay. So this is showing um, a test cross with genes that are on different chromosomes, okay? So they are um, taking the parentals here, the, we've got a big A, little b, and little a, little b, and then they cross, and then we have our, let me get off the marker, uh, homozygous parents there, uh, the A and the A, big A, big A are the same, little b, little b are the same, so they're homozygous. Then we cross them and we get this interesting, um, uh, this one right here, this F1, okay, of this generation that's got, a, it's a heterozygote, but we're going to test cross it back to a homozygous recessive, okay, and then we're going to, that has no dominant alleles, and then we can look at these gametes that are made by this heterozygote, and since all the genes are on, uh, they're on different chromosomes, we get uh, equally frequent next generations, okay, so these are so we have this terminology here that two gametes that have the same combination of alleles as the original homozygous parent okay are known as parentals if they have that phenotype so here we've got a capital a little b and that matches our you guys can't see my mouse when i do this we've got a capital a little b and that matches up to this particular parent okay and then over here we have this phenotype with the little a and the big B, which matches up with this parent. And that's why these two are called parental phenotypes because they match the original parents. Now these down here where we have a big A, big B, that's not something we saw in the, in the original cross that's called a recombinant, okay? And then same with the little a, little b, um, that's not in the parents either and that's a recombinant. Why don't I care about the second um, set of uh, things here. Why am I just circling the top ones? Well, because that's the gamete from this parent here. Okay, you can see we're always getting a pair of recessives from that parent, but we want to know is what's happening with um, the set of genes that came from from this one, the red one over here. Okay, how did these sort out and become different? So here's another example. This is my little handmade one as opposed to trying to use the uh, one from the book is that we've got, um, here's our heterozygote over here. That's, we're gonna cross with, uh, our heterozygote crossed with this um, all recessive individual, okay? So we're looking at the N trait is on chromosome one and the D trait is on chromosome two. And the possible gametes that we get out of this parent is we get an equal percentage of all the different um, gametes, right? Because they're all sorting independently. This is your uh, lovely Punnett square if we were to do this out. Okay? Uh, and then the offspring there, you're always going to get a homozygous or the um, recessive from the homozygous recessive over here. So we can see our offspring suss out okay? over there. So when we test unlinked genes, we're doing a different type of cross, right? We're, we're crossing almost doing like a back cross to a all, um, all homozygous recessive to see what happens to the dominant alleles, okay? 
So here's our homozygous parents, our true breeding lines, and we make our F1 heterozygote. The, they have, um, so here we've got ebony and apteris crossed with wild type, and then we have everything that appears to be wild type because they have one uh, copy of the each mutation, right? So then we take one of those test cross flies, okay, and cross it with a all homozygous recessive, and we see, again, this like one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio of the um, phenotypes, okay? because uh, the genes are unlinked and they're segregating independently. So there's the, uh, the cross here. Uh, and so we see our, does that actually help anything? I don't think that actually helps. But we have the four phenotypes are arising equally frequently off of this um, cross. So we're going to do this, this kind of test cross again, where we take, uh, in this case, we're going to look at black as a trait as opposed to ebony. It's a slightly different gene, but it also causes a very dark fly. Okay. And we cross it with a wild type and we get our F1 heterozygote line. And we take that heterozygous, the fly we know is heterozygous, and we cross it back to an all recessive fly. Okay. And so here's our, our heterozygous there. And what we're going to see is that certain phenotypes show up a lot more than other phenotypes. It's not an even split. The four phenotypes are not equally frequent. And you know we talked about parental and recombinant before. Well, here's our parental. Here's our wild type male. And we see most of our offspring are wild type. And we see here's our other was black and apteris. Most of our offspring are black and apteris. There's not, those are our parental phenotypes and they're showing up the most frequently. And very, very um, infrequently, we're getting different odd. These are the recombinant phenotypes. They're not the ones that were present in the parental generation. Our black body with normal wings or normal body with apteris. Okay. Since these, tra these traits are not segregating independently, they're clearly favoring the parental units. Therefore, the genes must be linked. So I could give you a cross and say, figure out if these are, are linked or not. And, or in, uh, you would take a look at the offspring. So let me do this uh, via cute little PowerPoint animation thing again. So we're looking again at our N trait and our D trait, but this time both traits are on chromosome one together. So we take our heterozygote there, cross it with the homozygous recessive, and we get, uh, there's a lot more gametes coming from this parent that are gonna be um, the parental types. So the ND, uh, the capital ND here, there, and the little n big D, here occasionally crossing over occurs and we between the two genes we get a swap right so occasionally there's a swap or a break in between but not very often it's more likely that they're not going to okay nope there's the parental gametes yep so crossing over occurs and then we get the recombinant gametes at that break and so that's why we get it. so some of these gametes the gametes we're looking at this parent that has some of the dominant alleles so we can follow them we know all the offspring are going to get uh, recessive um, alleles from the other parent. And so we see the, the gametes um, are reflected in the offspring. Okay, So we call these the parental offspring and then the recombinant offspring. Hopefully you're with me so far. Okay. So this is where it gets interesting because wherever the crossovers occur determines whether or not we actually see the linkage. All right. So we can have a crossover you know, way at the end of a chromosome here, and that's not going to actually affect our, um, uh, the particular genes we're looking at. We can have a crossover a little closer, still not going to affect. The crossover has to occur in between the two genes on the chromosome in order to get uh, a switch in, in gametes. And here's another example. Well, it's on this end, then it's not going to matter. So uh, kind of this is where we're looking at the frequency of how often is there a crossover in between those two genes will help tell us how far apart those genes are on the chromosome. Okay, so again, if you're somewhere else in the chromosome, only parents. If it's proximal, then it's between the centromeres and the genes. It's still you're only at gametes. You have to have that crossover between the two genes in order to get parental and recombinant gametes. Okay. So example here, uh, if the crossover occurs between the genes, then you're going to get parental and recombinant gametes. If the crossover occurred outside 
of the gene, you're only going to see parental gametes. Okay. Now here's the idea of linkage, okay, is that the distance apart on the chromosome matters. Okay. Let me get my drawing thing up. Okay. So in this case, um, if they're very, very far apart on opposite ends, it's very likely a crossover is going to happen between them. And you're going to see something that is closer to the one to one to one ratio than, than anything else. Okay. Whereas if they're very, very close together, then it's going to be very unlikely you're going to see recombinant uh, gametes occurring. Okay. Just because it's such a small chance. So this is how we're going to calculate our distance. Okay. Here's again our parental gametes uh, and our recombinant gametes. Okay. So here's the book's example again, is that if we have only two of the four chromatids are involved in a crossover, okay. so you're always going to have parental gametes that are not involved in the recombination, and then you're going to have the ones in the middle that do recombine. Okay. Recombinants are always less frequent than parentals. If your answer says otherwise, your answer is wrong and you need to go back and check it. Okay? This is because only two of the four chromatids are involved in a crossover and that crossovers that occur anywhere else, if they're not between the two genes, will produce parental gametes. Okay? So in this case, we want to look at two traits, the white eye and the yellow body that are both on the X chromosome looking at uh, whether or not crossover is happening in between those on the X chromosome. So we'd get our, our heterozygote here, F1 heterozygote with the female. We can cross to any particular male because we're only looking at the um, what's happening on the males here. So down here we get our F2s um, and we're looking at the males because they're the ones having one copy of the X chromosome and the X chromosome they're getting is from mom. They're getting mom's X chromosome, not dad's. They're getting the Y there. So we can see the recombination on that. We only look at the males. Okay. And then we see that we've got, here's the parental again, the white eyed normal body color um, is the parental trait here. And we have the red eyed yellow body color over here. And then we see our recombinants down here. So we've got our parentals and our recombinants. And then we can calculate out what the percentage is. You know, in this case, it's 99% parentals and 1% recombinant. Okay. That's sort of our first step. So here's two examples, uh, basically just showing um, either if these are considered alleles or intrans and that they're uh, a crossover. One, one chromosome has the... Um, uh, dominant and a recessive, the other crossover has the other recessive and the dominant. And then we see again, the, the, here's the parentals that are staying the same on the majority of the offspring, majority of the offspring, 99%, the alleles stay the same and only very infrequently, 1% of the time, is there this crossover. Okay. And then here is the, what we call the alleles are in cis, where we have both the dominant both the dominants are over here, both the recessives are over here, and still again, the majority of the offspring is going to have the alleles in the same place, um, and only very infrequently are we going to see that crossover in between. Okay. So in this case, we could look at um, the, the recombin fre recombination frequency is going to be the same no matter what the how the alleles are arranged in the chromosomes of the parent, whether or not they're in trans or in cis, okay? So that's what this is. slide basically is explaining what alleles in trans and alleles in cis mean, whether or not you've got the both the dominants together or if it's swapped one dominant, one recessive, okay? So crossing over on the X chromosome has some interesting implications for a lot of X-linked traits, one of which is the gene for, um, it's not the gene for colorblindness, it's the genes that produce the red opsin and the green opsins, which are needed in order to have those, um, the correct uh, configuration of the cone cells in the retina. And a lot of times this crossing over ends up being unequal because you've got two copies of the green opsin and the chromosomes don't line up correctly and you have a little bit of unequal crossing over and that's how you get either this hybrid gene that doesn't work very well or full on gene deleted. Um, sort of a interesting little thing there with the X chromosome. So this leads us into the idea of Centeni that, that our genes are located on the same chromosome. And then when you look at 
other genomes, you can match up different chromosome crossover points where things likely switched at one point in time in history. And we call the syntactic blocks of genes. So you see, um, we have a lot of genes in common with mice, but the arrangement of where those genes are on their chromosomes is swapped around a whole lot. There's been a whole lot of chromosome um, crosses and translocations and reversions and everything since humans and mouse had a similar common ancestor. Okay, so which didn't look the same as, of course, humans or mice, but had a bunch of these blocks, which have since been rearranged in certain ways. Okay. And however, the X chromosome is generally syntetic in all placental mammals. That thing has just been around a while and is uh, quite stable.